Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's live stream. I want to thank you all for taking out the time uh, from your day to come and uh, join me in this important conversation um, that I think is needed to be discussed. Now, today's topic is an important one. It's an issue that affects the lives of many women and girls around the world. Um, there is some conversation about boys experiencing this too, but primarily it's women and girls who deal with these types of situations. Um, sadly, the victims often suffer and they're sometimes even blamed for some of the things that happen to them. Incidences of gender-based violence, abuse, rape, have seen an increase during the lockdown period of this global pandemic. We've seen countries around the world talk about how there was an increase um, in violence against uh, women and girls during this particular time when people were forced to stay home in lockdown. That's not to say the situation wasn't bad before, it just became more polarized with people staying at home with their abusers, unfortunately. In Ghana, domestic and sexual violence is a big problem that hasn't been addressed adequately enough um, recently, there was a situation where a man named George Lutterdot um, was on TV and he calls himself a counselor and in an interview, he said that he believed that rape victims actually enjoy the act of being raped. I was so outraged by this statement that I started a petition to ban him from appearing on TV and radio media in Ghana. Now, it gained momentum, and thankfully, one TV station, GH1, uh, has banned him from appearing on future programs. There are others who continue to have him appear um, to give him his right to um, explain himself for making the statements to suggest that a victim being raped enjoys it. And that statement was quite problematic. Even though he says he's made an apology, the apology doesn't really sound like an apology. He sounded like he was trying to explain himself um, and validate what he said. Um, I personally have been insulted and accused of being called a fake feminist by people who support the statements that he made, um, and it is very problematic. This is just one example of some of the things that um, people experience uh, in this country when it comes to uh, being a victim. A lot of women um, are caught in situations of abuse and they're afraid to leave their environments for fear of having to start over. And some are even embarrassed to admit there is a problem in their homes. Um, there's so many factors that contribute to a woman not leaving right away. And one of those is not having anywhere to go for herself. Um, and if she has children, it's even worse. She wants to have a safe place to stay. Today, I have um, Isabel Afulmensa, who is the co-founder of Pearl Safe Haven, an organization that was started for the purpose of helping women in Ghana uh, find solutions to the abuse that they have experienced um, in their life. I also have Mr. Ni Olujualape, I hope I said your name correctly, um, from the UNFPA. He is the country uh, representative for Ghana. Um, and the UNFPA is working hard to uh, support women who are going through issues of um, violence, gender-based violence, um, equal inequalities experienced by women and girls. So I'm going to give the two of you both an opportunity to introduce yourselves. It looks like I may have lost Isabel. Her internet may have cut out there. Um, so I uh, will have you introduce yourself first and uh, let us know exactly about the UNFPA and your role there, Ni. Okay, thank you very much, Ivy. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be part of this program and um, thank you for inviting me. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk about the issues for which you work on, or uh, indeed the issues for which um, I have a passion and commitment, such as um, <clears throat> issues of sexual and gender-based violence, which is very, very important to UNFPA and the mandate that we have to deliver. It's always a pleasure. I take every opportunity with both hands. So my name is um, Ni Ojolakwe. I'm the country representative of United Nations Population Fund here in Ghana. Before now, I, I used to work in at the headquarters of UNFPA as special assistant to the executive director and later as the acting chief of staff to the chief executive. But thereafter, uh, with my coming to, to Ghana uh, about three years ago, um, we have been able to do our best in terms of um, getting to the agenda, I mean, delivering on the agenda of UNFPA, which is uh, encapsulated in three very, very clear transformational goals. The first one is that we want to bring to zero every 
uh, preventable maternal deaths in the country. The second zero that we will seek to achieve is to bring to zero the incidence of every unmet need for family planning. And the third zero, which is perhaps the biggest, but which is also linked across to the other two, is that we want to bring to zero the ins every incidence of sexual and gender-based violence and harmful practices in, in, in the country. Across these three, um, young people are in the focus. So, uh, so we also have a young people's program. I mean, all of our programs focus mainly around young people to give them support, to also give them everything that they need to be able to achieve their full potentials at, at, at the end of the day. I'll be able to elaborate a bit more, uh, a bit more as we go on, especially on the subject of sexual and gender-based violence. So I want to thank you once more for having me. All right, thank you so much for joining. Um, Isabel, I'll have you introduce yourself now and tell us about what you do uh, and the Pro Safe Haven. Sure, thank you so much for having uh, me on. So my name is Isabel. I'm one of the three co-founders of the Pro Safe Haven. We, uh, it's an NGO that was founded in 2018, and really our focus, um, the core of our organization is to build a safe house or an eventually safe haven. We found that in the gender sector, um, there were no safe havens at the time when we started our campaign. There were no safe havens in Ghana, which meant when a woman, and I say woman because most cases are female, but when a woman went through violence, she had nowhere to escape to. And uh, research shows that when a woman can actually move somewhere else and actually spend some time transforming their lives and, and uh, have the, the structure, social and, and um, financial and economic infrastructure to help them move forward, they're able to move past the abuse. So that was really the crux of um, the team coming together. And we are also focused on just generally changing the narrative in Ghana. Uh, there's a lot of negative narrative here. There's a lot of, there's a culture of shame and silence in Ghana. So you talk about abuse, you know, people talk about it in jokes, um, you know, banter, that's not really healthy. There are a lot of people who go through abuse, but keep it quiet. And so, you know, part of what we do as well is to try to raise awareness, not just on our own, but really working with coalition partners and, and other advocates in the space and uh, the UNFPA is one of the key advocates in this area in this country and so you know working with them but really with the focus of building the state house and helping where we can to support advocacy in this country. Great 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 thank you so much. Um, I want to remind everyone watching that um, put your questions and your comments in the comment box. I'll put it on the screen if you have anything that you want to contribute to the conversation. Um, and we'll make sure that it, it gets addressed. So I appreciate all of you who have tuned in today. I know this is not a uh, glamorous subject to discuss, but it is a very important one. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of people suffering in silence. And as you said, Isabel, there's this um, culture of shame that happens. And unfortunately, there's uh, people who are suffering in silence. Um, now, regarding yeah. the um, Pearl Safe Haven and building a safe house. Now, for somebody who may be watching and is not familiar with safe houses, because um, in Ghana, it's not something that has historically been common. Can you explain exactly what a safe house is and why it's important to yeah. um, survivors? So, you know, even within safe houses, you have so many different types. You have, on, on one end, you know, you have emergency shelters, and that's really where somebody can just escape to, um, where, you know, it's maybe 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, so they have to flee from a dangerous situation. And then you've got transitional housing, which is maybe a week, two weeks, so you're helping the person transition from one place to another. Um, and then you have where we fall, which is a refuge. So that's where they can come It's a longer period. We're looking at having our survivors, or we call them our clients, there for um, three months. And then on the far end, which you know, we don't have in this country, you've got sort of longer term housing. You see that maybe in, um, in the drug rehab space where you need a longer space, right? So when you look at other jurisdictions, they've got a whole spectrum of 
you know, that's a structure that you need in the sector. And in, in this country, um, sadly, you know, we are very under-resourced in this area. And so even what we're doing is, is different. Uh, you have very few safe houses, very, very few. Uh, when we started, it was zero. And uh, as I mentioned, the idea is for, for our health safety, then the women will be staying with us for three months. And after the three months when they transition out, we have another six month period where we help them go into their chosen path. And I love what you said that, you know, this is not a glamorous subject, but really what happens with abuse is, it's, I, I call it an interruption. You know, this is somebody who's living their life and then their the life is interrupted by rape or physical abuse or, um, you know, a, an abusive situation. And so what we're very focused on doing is providing not just the shelter, um, physical shelter, but also the soft infrastructure around the woman. So what, what were they doing before? You know, there's a case we're dealing with, she was frying fish, right? So how do we help her move on and continue in her life and make, and, and make her better? Um, and so that is, that's really the plan. And so the refuge is a place of, of, the, of the state. Um, and like I said, depending on where you are on the team, for us, it's not just a place of the state, but it's also a place to be habilitated. We have doctors, we have psychologists who are working with us. We have different people who are coming to do empowerment training, basic ICT, basic um, understanding of your CV, obviously confidence issues, legal advice if you need it. So it's a place that they can stop and take stock of what's happened, and then we can help them transition out. Okay, all right. Um, Ni, I wanted to ask you, um, are there any types of uh, programs right now that the UNFPA um, has in place to support women who are in these situations when they want to get out? Well, um, the, um, it's a complex situation, what we have in the country. Um, we, when people are in this type of situation and they, they, they even report, what we usually have is a situation whereby families and we have strong familial ties in Ghana, in every African country anyway. Yeah. Families come in, yeah. they try to convince people to stay. Most of them even at the risk of their lives. I've seen situations in which people have been convinced to stay and then they lost their lives at the end of the day. So what we have is that families come in, they try to persuade people the other place where people go to for succor is the church or with the or with their religious leaders. The religious leaders will convince the individual to stay in there. Even where harm has been done, and everybody knows that this is actually too much, that it is impossible for them to stay in the circumstances, they find a way to settle it. They call, you know, it's a family matter. Let's just keep it the way it is. You don't, well, even if you are not staying together anymore, uh, you have to think of your children. You have to think of other family. And so it's a very, very complex structure to get anybody to come because there is also the essence, the sustainability. <clears throat> so what happens to this individual? Okay, you save this woman now from the problem, from the violence that she's experiencing. After a week or so, or two, you, um, I'm sure you'll find the woman actually wants to go back, wants to go back because there are familiar things, there are the business probably that she's going, um, that she has, the environment that she's used to, the friends that she's used to. So you don't really want, you don't really have them wanting out completely. So what we need to do is to find a way. For, for me, I'm very, very heavy on the issue of deterrence. Deterrence as a result of either prosecution of those who, I mean, who cross the line, or deterrence as a result of getting them to either pay every fine or something like that, so that it doesn't happen anymore because eventually, it's only a very, very tiny fraction of the people that we're talking about who will leave 
that entire setting total because it also destabilizes the woman and the woman continues to suffer. It's a vicious cycle. You can't leave the home and not suffer from leaving the home. So at the end of the day, we will still have to go back to encourage them to try and reintegrate into the society, but it involves a lot of cost and it's not sustainable to think that um, we'll be able to provide a place for them where they'll be able to stay and then live their lives again. But then we'll, we'll, we'll eventually still need to find a way to make um, like um, Isabel's um, outfit, so to say, which is the safe oven too. We'll have to find a way to make it a transit point from first safety and at the end of the day, to move them to a situation whereby they can reintegrate, reintegrate pass back into the society without without going back to the danger they were facing. But it, it's it's a socio-economic thing. You have to make sure that they have their jobs back. You have to make sure that they have their trades back if it is trade that they are that they are getting involved in. There is also the the friends, the associate, the relations that they have. So they will still be able to have that so that they can go back to more or less their normal lives without the disruption of, uh, without the dangers of, uh, of, the, of going back to that same abusive husband. Oh, this is, uh, everything you've said is just so, so sad um, and disappointing because I have heard the stories of people um, going to the church and going to their family members who convinced them to stay in the situations that are only going to bring more harm. Um, one of the comments that I just had uh, put on the screen there was from uh, Kwame, who said that, you know, sadly, uh, he knows a lady who lost her life. Um, and that's an unfortunate situation. Um, what are some of the things that we can say to people um, to encourage them that even though their family members or their church is trying to convince them to stay, what are some of the things we can encourage them to do to get out of the situation? Either one of you can answer that. I, I, I don't even know. Uh, Sorry, me, go on. Okay, I don't even know what you can tell them. So what will be right to say? Like um, the person who contributed now just said, I know of, of I know of somebody also who kept um, who was who was encouraged by the pastor every now and then. Don't worry, the Lord will do it. Divorce is not an option. You can't leave your husband and what of you. And eventually, the lady died, not because the husband wanted to kill her, but in one of the in one of the beating episodes, there was a mistake. She hit her head against the wall and then she died. So that risk is always there. Now, um, I don't know what you tell that individual to do, but I think ahead of the violence happening, we need to put things in place. We need to put uh, systems in place. That's why it is a systemic issue. We need to put systems in place that will prevent or that will be a deterrent. And I'll give you some examples. When COVID-19 started, and then we had all, I mean, the, the, the government came out and the government was supporting um, the health sector response. Every, every part of, I mean, the government came out forcefully to attack COVID-19, uh, but it was um, <clears throat> equipping the hospitals, providing testing centers, sending out messages about washing your hands and all of that. It was health sector focused. Nobody really saw the gender implications of this. But there are gender implications, just like any other activity that anybody would do. But then, fortunately, from our own side, we're able to see it from the gender lens to say, hmm, what will happen? And you see, there is always a gender implication when you are dealing with, uh, when you are dealing with such outbreaks, such, uh, such uh, things as this. For example, uh, we know that um, a, a pandemic such as this will affect women and men differently. And epidemics usually make existing inequalities for women and girls and discrimination of uh, other marginalized groups such as persons with disability to be worse because there are already, many people are already in poverty. The women represent nearly 70% of the health workforce globally anyway. So, and enough attention is not given to how their work environment may be discriminated. So there are many issues that women face. So we, at least I know for, for us in UNFPA, 
we saw this ahead and we said, okay, what are we going to do in order to forestall whatever damages that are likely to happen? So while government face the health sector, we have also a, lot, a number of our partners who also face several parts of it. We saw the gender part as our own core competence and there was a big gap there. And we tried to fill it. First, we worked with um, Dovsu to reactivate this domestic violence hotline. And so at least something needs to be done. Let somebody call somewhere and then maybe there is a help or some or something. So, and we also went to town on the television, on radio, discussion programs, and what have you to say. There's a number you can call if you notice any domestic violence anywhere, or if you notice sexual and gender-based violence anywhere. It, might, it doesn't just necessarily have to be you. It might be your neighbor or anybody. There is a number. So we put a lot of pressure on that number. We used um, uh, audio on-air personalities, people with influence or what have you, to send out the message. So the number was out there. So we've been trying to analyze what has been the result of that? Because there were many calls that came in. We still have a lot of gap in, gaps in what can be done, what needs to be done, and we're still going to talk about it. But then, one of the things that I saw, which was very, very cryptic, which everybody needs to understand, it's actually also very funny, but it was effective, was that this number, the Dobsu number, I was speaking with somebody just this last week. Because I also try to be a social scientist. I get into a taxi just to find out what people are saying and all of that. And so I got talking with this guy. And the guy told me, that, oh, that thing, that number was very effective. Oh. And he said his wife took one of the flyers that we were sharing, which had the number, and actually placed it in the sitting room. This number is there. If you touch me, I'm going to make that call. And the guy was the one that told me that to a certain extent, to a large extent, that stopped him from doing what he would usually have done. That is just a little bit, just an outer of the things that we can achieve if we put out information out there that there are consequences for committing this offense. What we need to do as a country is to put systems in place that lets everybody understand that if you do this, there are consequences that you will have to face anytime it happens. So it will include putting laws in place, putting policies in place, putting the, um, the law enforcement agents and enabling them, empowering them to actually undertake the uh, investigative and prosecutorial roles that they are supposed to be carrying out, doing everything that is possible. Once that feeling of anarchy or I can get away with it, once it is not there, you will see gender-based violence will reduce. So for me, it's a systemic issue. Trying to look at it at the end point to say, how do we solve the problem of the woman that has been beaten and what have you? Yes, it is curative, but there is a preventative part of it that we need to, that we need to really consider. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, for people who are watching, because I do have an um, audience watching outside of Ghana as well, um, the Dove Su he's referring to is the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit in Ghana. Um, and for anybody who's watching, you're in Ghana and maybe you want to report any domestic um, violence issues, the phone number is 055 one zero 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 nine hundred. I'll I'll uh, create a banner and put it on the screen so that uh, you can call if you miss me calling out the the line number. So um, for people who don't know, that's what it is. So Isabel, what is your um, comment um, after he's given his comments on it? I agree. Um, you know, me is hit it. it. It's a systemic issue, so it's not as if you can see one thing. Um, I think, you know, culturally, I mentioned shame and silence. That's one of the big factors. But culturally, there are also things that we do as Ghanaians, maybe as Africans as well. We haven't looked at it beyond. But for example, there's, there's a high premium on marriage, right? And we have to say it as it is. So when you are married, there's a big focus for you to stay married at all costs. And that cost sometimes is your dignity and sometimes that cost is your life. Um, there's a narrative in the church and in the religious organizations, and I'm Christian, but it, it, it's something that we, as 
Christians and religious people also have to address, which is if you are married, you must do all these things because you are married. And so a lot of women stay in very dangerous positions because they don't want to come out of the, the status quo. Um, there's, for example, and this is a high premium on children, right? So when you combine all these things and you don't tell the woman, actually you have rights under our constitution and you have rights under our criminal code and you have rights under the Domestic Violence Act and you have rights for your children under the Children's Act, they just walk through life based on the narratives of our culture. And that's really, really one of the big issues that we're trying to change. And I think, you know, I always say for, for us as Ghanaians or as Africans, it's not going out to say, me too, me too, me too. Right? There's, there's a power in that, but we have to also curate it for our own culture. So you can't just put a hashtag and say, me too, because the guy you're saying, me too, is a priest, a pastor, a doctor. Um, he's somebody in society. It, this is not something that just happens in the lower class, in the village. This is happening at all tiers of society. I think, again, that's what people forget. It's just dialed out differently, right? When you are in a poor family, you don't want to be returned, again, because it's a high premium in marriage. So you stay in the situation. When you are from a wealthy background, you don't want to lose the status quo of walking up to church with your husband and sitting together and driving in the city. There's also status quo. And so I think we have to, we want to give women the tools. I give you it to me. For me, it's education. That's how you empower people. But I'm a lawyer by background. And so apart from the house, my real passion is how do we get some cases done? You know, we've got incredible acts. We've got the laws, but we have no enforcement. How do we actually say, this happened to this person. I don't care who you are. I don't care that you're a minister or a pastor or a doctor or a lawyer even. But this is what happened. And this is how the law works itself out. Um, I think it's, it's the law plus the education and, and like what UNFPA are doing, you know, putting out a number. But again, when you put out a number and you have nowhere to send the women. We had a case yesterday. The man has been severely beating up his wife. She has two young kids under the age of 15. And um, he has he said to her, I will kill you and I will kill myself. And it came to our to the Paul State Haven's attention. And of course, our haven is not open yet. So we have to finance her to stay in a secret hotel for the next two weeks because we need to find out how we can arrest the guy. We need to get her, you know, her and her, and her family into safety. Right, but those, that's the reality on the ground. But nobody is looking, and it's just because somebody in her life cared enough about her to flag it with somebody else who then raised the inquiry with us. And immediately within 12 hours, we had taken her out of her, her home into a safe place, um, into like into a small hotel where she's hidden for the next two weeks so we can face with the man. But if we don't arrest the man and we just let him go, you know, there's another case we're dealing with where the husband was beating up the wife and she would complain. And again, the same thing we were saying, the family said, oh, go back, go back, go back. So a month ago, um, he started again. I don't know what happened. This time he took a cutlass and started wielding it at the woman. And they have a two-year-old daughter. So she got the daughter and ran out of the house and he cuts off the daughter's leg. Now, the daughter is two years old. Explain that your father cut off your leg in anger. And you know what we did? We arrested him. This is we as a country. We arrested him. And then we let him out on bail. So the woman who's the, the victim, and we don't like using the word victim. We always talk about survivors. But in this case, you know, the woman who's the victim and her daughter were forced to flee. And the husband who's the perpetrator is just chilling in his house. And that's what I mean by, you know, if we're not taking it seriously and actually taking action, and, and that's what I mean, you're saying there's a systemic issue, you've got to deal with it at this point. But you can't just say, hey, you guys, you've got rights, right? If I if I go and talk about my rights at home and I get beaten, are you picking me up? Um, is Dobson a resource to pick me? Is there a safe house for me to go to? Are you going to help me restart my business? Are you going to put my kids in school? Are you going to actually sue my husband and, and be committed to the whole court process? If you're not going to do any of those things, then it's better for the woman to just go home.
you know, and and that's the issue. It's a, it's a big, big issue. We need help across the whole spectrum. Um. So, you can tell I'm incomplete. I'm I'm just like mortified. Um, for those watching um, abroad, um, she mentioned that uh, the husband used a cutlass. In Canada and the U.S., we say a machete. So for those of you watching and don't didn't know what that meant, a cutlass is what they refer to it in Ghana. I think the U.K. also says cutlass as well. But in the U.S. and Canada, we said uh, machete um, and cut off his daughter's legs. That is absolutely disgusting that the man is even out um, walking the streets. Yeah. Um, it makes me go back to, there's a comment here um, that um, Hannah Aqua made saying, how are we training and increasing awareness to the police? Um, it just makes me think of law enforcement because um, I know that there's some accountability there as well. Um, you know, one example was somebody I knew, uh, I, well, I didn't know her personally. She was a friend of a friend who went to the police about something and the police, you know, were quite dismissive um, about the situation. So, um, Maybe one of the two of you can answer this. Is do you, do you know if there's anything that's done as far as police sensitivity training um, in this area? Because it is a problem. Maybe Ni, maybe you can address this one. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, for, um, the points that have been made and the stories that we're hearing, I mean, as gory, as they have, they have such that I mean, they tell you that that tells you what we have in the society and how complex these um, these issues are. They they go beyond just what we have in the ordinary, and therefore there are different parts of the entire architecture that we need to look at and it's fixing. Um, people will commit offenses when they feel that nothing is going to come out of it. When they feel that they will get away with it, there is a there is a there, there is a preponderance of people committing such things. In any event, um, coming back to what we do in terms of um, with police, we work with the um, with the domestic violence and victim support unit of the Ghana Police. The Ghana Police, um, the Ghana Police as a whole, over time, Ghana is a very progressive country. Over time, it has been discovered. It has been it has been decided that um, the issue of domestic violence and sexual and gender-based violence and all of those issues that they deserve special attention. So, a particular unit was carved out of the Ghana Police for everybody. I mean, for them to look after the issue of domestic violence. So, you can see that there's a political will on the part of government to make this happen. Now, you want to look at okay, what were the officers? What do they know? What are they doing? What, how are they? How much are they empowered to do their stuff? And I can tell you, I can tell you because I'm in the I'm in the ringside seat, so to say, that um, there's a lot of training that is going on. We have another one that is scheduled for um, two weeks time to bring in quite a number of um, police officers in the investigative cadre for them to for them to understand what are the current best practices, what are the laws what is permissible, what is not. So there is a continuous, and I can tell you that the, that the director of DOPSU is very heavy on bringing uh, uh, men and women, um, so to say, in, um, up to, I mean, to tune about what they need to do, what are the latest tricks that they can use in investigating and making sure that they bring offenders to book. So we're working with them on that, and there are also quite a number of other agencies and donors that are working with them to train the police officers so that they can be up and doing about um, about their job. But then it doesn't also end there. When uh, when the police are involved, they will have also a system. We have a judicial system that might not be the fastest at times. So uh, so when when you put a, when you report a case to those two, yes, those two goes there. They look at it. They, the first thing they want to do is to investigate to, and to see. Is it possible? Are we going to be able to get a conviction out of this? In a situation whereby somebody has been raped and the person has actually left the scene, has gone, I mean, has gone to seek succor or comfort elsewhere, there is no evidence. So there is a there is a question about preserving the evidence. And to preserve the evidence, you want to be able to tell them that the first thing to do is to get the police involved so that they can get the evidence and so that at the end of the day, the culprits might be 
brought to book. So all of those um, those are issues that need to be brought to the attention of the society, to the people that are involved, so that they will know what to do. So from there also, there is a there is an essence of prosecution. And going to court, we also need our judicial officers to know what is permissible, so that they are not they are not um, they are not driven by their cultural sense or the paternalistic sense of oh you too why did you talk to your husband like that and you know things like that might come up so so the judicial officers also need to be um to be um brought up to speed about what needs to be done so it's a it's, a, it's an entirely systemic thing but in terms of training and what have you we are doing our best in terms of um, training the police but there is still a lot more that needs to be done the entire rank and file of the domestic violence unit needs to be uh, needs to be um, given the proper education and training. There is a challenge there anyway. They still, even though they belong to Job 2 as a unit right now, we find out that we train some people after some time, they are transferred to the, the traffic unit. So when all of the investment that we, we have put in that training, in training that particular officer, is taken to traffic unit where they are they have to be using it um, elsewhere. Sometimes it's a welfare unit or what have you. So we we'll have to go back again to start training. And we are making um, advances towards um, the police hierarchy to try and professionalize the issue of domestic violence, sexual and gender based violence, so that when somebody is in this court, they will be able to um, gain from um, from working in this particular area over time, and there will be experiences, there will be skills that have been discovered that would have been developed over time, which will be uh, will be used to the advantage of the people at the end of the day. Okay. Um, now, you brought up something regarding uh, getting evidence. Um, so one of the challenges in Ghana with respect to that is, I mean, in, and in any country, when a woman um, is raped or a child is raped, or in Ghana they say defiled, um, under the laws for a minor, um, going to the hospital and getting a, uh, a rape kit test done to check, um, you know, the injuries, um, that every, that it was by force and, um, also to check for DNA evidence of the, um, the perpetrator, um, is really key in collecting evidence. Um, but there is a challenge in Ghana when it comes to cost. Um, right now, there is a petition from uh, actress and producer Amake Abebrese on change.org to abolish medical examination fees for all victims of rape and sexual assault in Ghana. Um, she's currently um, heading towards 15,000 signatures. And um, here's a little piece of information for people who don't know this could be something that prevents people from going to get the evidence that's needed. So currently in Ghana, victims of rape, sexual assault, and defilement have to pay between 300 to 800 Ghana cities, which is 45 to $160, depending on the exchange rate, in order to undergo a medical examination and get a report in order for the police to do the necessary investigation. Um, and in Ghana, the average reported monthly salary in the informal sector is 150 Ghana cities, which is between 25 and $30 a month. So can you imagine if you are a woman who doesn't even make that kind of money, but yet that's what's expected of you to pay to get uh, this test done, for the evidence needed by the police to even start an investigation. So what happens is some of them probably don't even do the test and then there's no evidence for them to use. Um, Isabel, I know that you are working towards um, the safe house. Um, is there anything in place that um, your organization is doing to help women with these types of costs? Is it something you've thought about? We are. So, you know, all the women who will um, come into the safe house, all everything is taken care of. And in our package, we have a survivor package um, for the women. But the first thing is the medical costs. Um, so we, it's just prohibitive for a lot of women. And keep in mind as well that it's not every hospital you can go to. You can only go to government hospitals. And so you're talking about sometimes queues and you've got to do the rape kids within um, a short period of time, often 24 hours. And so then when we think about culture of shame and silence, most women will talk about the rape months and months after uh, the rape has occurred. And so this comes back to the, the question of how do we empower women to know that if this happens to you, this is what you have to do. If you wait for three, six, eight months, um, that evidence is gone, right? So then it becomes 
in, in law, it, it's, it's circumstantial, right? So I have to tell my story, you have to tell your story, and it goes, it goes back and forth. And so it's so important as well that when we're educating women, we have to say, if this happens, and that's what, it's what I wish for anyone, but where it happens, this is what you guys have to do so that you put yourself in the best position to get, um, you know, to get the person um, tried and, and in a competent court of justice, court of law. So there, okay. there's a lot of stuff that we need to make sure that women are also even aware of. The cost is prohibited, but the women who come into the safe house, we assume that cost. We're assuming all the costs of the three months and critical is um, the rape test. Not every woman will work with you. That's the other thing. And again, I think um, what our role is to, is to present all the options and allow the woman with advice to make their own decision. Not every woman wants to pursue because the courts can also be very lengthy. That's the other issue. Yeah. For me, again, as a lawyer, I, I'm hoping we'll get to a place that we can have fast track courts and you can put your evidence in one, you know, in a witness statement and it can be recorded. But it's very detrimental to have a woman narrate her story over and over again and have to be cross-examined by very callous, um, and sometimes it's men and sometimes it's also women, right? You have a lot of women who are like, well, why did you put yourself in that position to be raped? And so for, as a survivor, it's very difficult to have to narrate and, have, and almost justify uh, yourself over and over again. And so I'm hoping that as part of the spectrum that Mimi talks about. Uh-oh, looks like we lost her in the feed. I know her internet keeps jumping in and out. So um, I'm sure she'll be back uh, very quickly. Um, so go I, ahead, Nii. I, I'm feeling, up, feeling far for the time being. Um, there are two sides to the issue. Oh, okay, she's back. Isabel is back. Yeah, she's back. Are you done? Yeah, he, he so was I was saying it. it yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Me? Yes. This is my Ghana Wi Fi. Um, it, it, we have to get to a point where we actually have um, that fast track system. And again, it's when you, when you see that I can be arrested and prosecuted. It acts also as a deterrence, uh, you know, to to that sort of crime. But right now, we're not really testing the cases. There are very few cases that get to court. We've got a great domestic violence act. Um, one of the other things I would say is, you know, you've got to empower the people who are doing the job. I feel very strongly for the people in the DOPSU team and the social welfare department, and even the gender ministry. They don't have the resources to even help the women, you know? So sometimes we we can say, yes, there's a training issue, um, absolutely, et cetera. But I think one of the things we've realized as well as our role as the person came in is how do we partner along with DOPSU, with the Domestic Violence Victim Support Unit? Because you have incredible people who are experts in their field. They know how to deal with women. They know how to deal with the situation, but they don't have the resources. So the case I talked about yesterday, we send the money you know, we don't, we don't, we don't call and say, "Hey, there's this situation," you know, in this area of Accra. We yeah. send money because she can't just go there with a smile and a prayer. And so, I think part of what we have to do as well is really take seriously this sector and resource the people. You'd be surprised to know that in Dobsu in Central Accra, they have two cars. So sometimes, you know, something happens and you say, "Well, how are they going to? How are they supposed to?" supposed to work. There's a, DOPSU, there's a domestic violence support fund, which is supposed to be funded every year. It hasn't been funded for over seven years. And wow. it's not like the fund was a lot of money. It hasn't been funded. And one of the premier lawyers here, Martin Pebu, took it to court. And you know he, he's a constitutional lawyer. He took it to court and said, hey, like this is law and government, you are required to fund it. And the high court agreed gave him judgment in his favor, two years on, it still hasn't been funded. So how do you expect people to work when they don't have the tools, you know? And so again, you know, back to your question, our role we feel as the Pearl State Paving is to say, look, this woman is coming in. Doksu, don't think about anything apart from what you are excellent in doing as Doksu. We're gonna figure out how to get her from the situation to our safe haven. We're gonna figure out how to feed her. We're gonna figure out how to maintain the house so it doesn't shut down. We're gonna figure out how to train her up. We're gonna partner with people to train them. 
we're, you know, you guys just focus on what you do best, which is dealing with vulnerable women and men and children and making sure that they get back to a position of strength. That's what they're good at. But they're not good at fundraising. They're not good at figuring out how to buy cars and, and funding. And so I think it's really important that when we're talking about the police and uh, DOFSU and social welfare, we also understand the very, very tight constraints within which they work. And um, like you said, apart from empowering them with training, it's also empowering them with stuff. Right, right. Um, Ni, were you going to say something before when we had lost um, Isabel in the feed? Yes. Now, now that she's found, maybe she has said she has said everything. That okay. I, you know, but let me just add just one or two things um, to put it in perspective. When a crime occurs that has to do with domestic violence, first the offender needs to be brought to book, mm -hmm. which is what Dobsu basically looks after. They will try and go to the crime scene. <clears throat> apprehend the offender, bring the offender to book. But there is the essence of comfort and succor and even damages, so to say, mental and physical to the human being who was assaulted. That uh, society has not really put any investment to look after that, which is why what um Isabel and Co, what they do is very, very important. Because even if even if the offender is put to death, that does not that does not assuage the um the the victim or the survivor in any in any particular way. The victim will need psychosocial support, might also be medical, might be legal, it might I mean there are so many things that is needed apart from the safety that is provided. So, so that's one thing we're looking at now to see, okay, since we have Dobsu in place, if we can retool Dobsu to be able to do their own beats very well, without need to focus on the victim, to find out what are the things that we need to do. It's unfortunate that um, the issue that was mentioned about um, what they need to pay in terms of uh, medical fees to do a test. Now, it is a test not even curative it is not even to look after the individual it's to just find out just to be sure that that crime took place there are several other things that needs to that needs to be um taken into account for example there is um there is a need for clinical management of that um of that act such as um, there are things that are needed such as forensic kits uh um, that will look at, um, that will sort out the issues of cervical and vaginal tears. The, there is a kit that also look at that, looks at that. There is a um, post-rape treatment kits and dignity kits. All of those things, they are, they are very, very necessary. We also need to put in place um, a GBV referral pathway and information so that they are available and so that they, um, it's available and disseminated regularly to all partners and everybody that needs to do their own bit there. So there is also the need for um, ethical and safe collect collection and um, use of um, gender and GB related data throughout all, all that we do. So there are so many things that need to be done to be able to provide comfort and succor. But, and so we are looking at that now. So we are, we are, I mean, in the next day or two, we are going to be out there seeking for volunteers. There are people who are ready to provide their own, to do their own bit to support the war against sexual and gender-based violence. For example, there are, um, maybe somebody is a lawyer and say, well, I can offer my services for free. Somebody is a psychologist or a psychiatrist, of, for, well, for example, say, okay, I can actually offer counseling services for those who are affected or for survivors. There are people that are medical people that can say, okay, I'm a nurse, I don't have resources, I don't have money to give you, but then if there's somebody that has gone through maybe incest that's taken place in a particular, somebody has been defied, they can say, okay, I can go look after that child and make sure that she's fine. So we're going to be putting out a call out there for those who are ready, I mean professionals, not those people looking for jobs really, professionals, and we want to get them together. We're going to do, uh, we're going to get those to do some vetting of these people. Then we're going to, we're going to pre-position them. So as much as possible, when the calls coming, 
will tell Dovsu this has happened in this particular place. You can go and look at it from your own side. But on another side, we need to look at it, examine what the issues are. And thereafter, at least get maybe a counselor to speak with this person, get somebody to go provide treatment and what have you. So we're going to be rolling that out in the next couple of days, as a matter of fact. So that let's us put something in place. And then for the for the shelters, we are also planning as much as so beyond what they think, beyond what fair safe urban things, we're going to be providing a lot of support to make them work well. And she's not smiling, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, okay, great. So, you know, I'm going to, uh, we've been, we've talked about physical, sexual, and in a couple of comments you said, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the emotional and mental. I want to do this quick overview of uh, recognized forms of gender-based violence that um, Isabel had sent to me in a document. Um, so people who may not understand or may not know, because people sometimes will ask themselves, is this uh, a form of abuse? Is this something that I should report? Because people are a little bit confused. So, you know, under the, um, you know, gender-based violence, we have um, sexual harassment and humiliation. We have physical or sexual assault, early child marriage, dangerous gender-biased um, cultural practices like FGM, rape, Defilement, which is defined as sexual abuse of minors. We have psychological, mental, and emotional abuse. We have economic abuse, uh, which is financial deprivation, uh, incest, and then trafficking of girls and young women for labor and sex. Um, so those are all um, different um, areas of um, gender-based violence. Yeah, um, for you know, yeah. Nee, you were saying something? There are several others. Some okay, go ahead. Very horrible things that I, I, I'm still, I'm still going to. I'm sorry that I don't. I've not even researched on this. But it's what they call breast ironing. So Ooh. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what it means. Mm. There is also um, virginity testing. No, oh, this guy, you have become promiscuous. Now I'm going to check you out. You know. So there are several of such things that are, that are the malaise in the society. But mm. if you permit me, honestly, because we're going to be, we should look, there, there are the big issues that need immediate attention first. There are some that are sort of um, debatable, even though they should not, not naturally be. Because what, one, of the, one of our methods of work is to engage um, the traditional community leaders and faith-based leaders to help spread the message. When you talk to a faith-based leader that uh, rape is not good, there's no argument. It's only the point at which you are going to say, oh, if somebody's, in, if somebody's at a risk of being beaten, that uh, the person should leave the husband. They can have an argument with you around that. But let's even look at the major issues first that is very, very important. Let's put it before them to say, we want you to help us to pass the message across that this should not happen. Uh, on a TV uh, program yesterday or the day before, I gave an example of an example of something that happened in the Bible. A woman was brought before Jesus Christ to say, oh, this woman needs to be stoned because she committed adultery. And Jesus looked around, because Jesus is a gender activist. Jesus was a gender activist. So Jesus looked around and he, was, he wanted to free the lady because the obvious question you want to ask is, who did she commit the adultery with? She couldn't have committed it with herself. Mm -hmm. Where is the man? They didn't bring the man. Meanwhile, the law actually says that if somebody is caught in the act of adultery, the person should be stoned to death. It should actually be, it's the man and the woman. But they brought only the woman before them. So Jesus looked around and said, okay, Whoever has not committed, whoever does not have a sin, should be the first to should be the first to throw a stone. So before he bent down and looked up, all the accusers had left. The point I want to make from that is this: Jesus was very smart about it. He could have confronted them, and they could have confronted him back, and the woman might have been killed. But he went about it very gingerly, very very smartly, and then. He went around it. I passed the message across and saved the woman. 
the woman, the issue was not even that the woman did not commit adultery. That was not even what Jesus was saying. But to say, this person cannot be wrong if you don't have the other person. So we have to we have to face our gender advocacy. We have to go about our gender advocacy in a very very smart way. There is what you call what you call the entry point based on which when that is accepted then you go to the other issue so that you can get people on board to make to pass the message across mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i want to uh thank you so much for for um all of those comments that you made um i want to quickly uh show on the screen here um the the pro safe haven um website yeah, they do have campaigns that they run in order for you to um donate to the cause um, of them building a safe house this is the current progress um, of uh, one of the safe houses that's uh, being built um, they still have a little ways to go to complete this place um, and for those joining uh, we are in conversation if you are just joining now we are in conversation talking about uh, finding solutions for people um, with sexual and um, physical se sexual physical abuse um, emotional abuse which has come up in the conversation as well um, pro safe haven is uh, been doing that for a couple of years now and is building this safe house for uh, women and you know their children if they have any to get out of situations of um, of uh, violence, emotional, physical um, abuse. So um, I want you to quickly mention, because we had a conversation before where you had said that there was a safe house in other parts of the country. I think you said one or two that have just recently been, been built. Of course, you can't say the exact location, but um, the region that it's in, if you can mention it, and people can look it up for themselves if they're trying to find a place to go in their region in Ghana. Yeah, so everything goes through the Domestic Victim uh, Support Unit, DOCSU. So uh, we do have one in Greater Accra. Um, they fundraise it, fundraise it and open. And we have one uh, that was built by Action Aid in the Northern <laughs> region as well. So, you know, the safe havens or the, the refugees uh, are either under DOCSU or the Department of Social Welfare. And so that's always the, the route to, to which, even though we are building the safe house, um, the Pearl Safe Haven, and we are responsible for the financial and operational management of it, we're very closely aligned with those. So for example, where we have a situation come in, like the case I mentioned that we're dealing with the live issue, I go through the DOFSU. And so the case management file is with both companies. So we're very focused to ensure that we're empowering Dotsu and not trying to take a role that, that we need to help. And mm -hmm. so um, there are two that exist. We will have ours open by the end of uh, August, this next month. And um, we will be able to house the first phase of women. We'll have a capacity of 20 women by the time we're done, which will be really great. Um, and I'll be amiss to, not to mention just the, the kind of support we've got because Really, this this is a really difficult sector to be in, and so we've just had incredible support. So, for example, the cement diamond cement gave us, and we focus on being sustainable. So we've got solar from Wilkins Engineering, and we've got a borehole drilled by Geo um, Geo Drill. And again, it's because we're we're a management team of business people. We have to think how does this. Oh, we lost her again. <laughs> Uh, that's the Ghana internet. Uh, sometimes you're in places where the network is not the best. Um, I know me, those of you who watch me, uh, you know that I have two internets in my house. I have, um, I have uh, MTN and I have Vodafone. So when one goes out, I quickly switch to the other. Isabel, you're back. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go I ahead. I can hear you. All right, go ahead. Yeah. So um, it's it's really important that um, the corporate sector and the and the private sector really partner. We call our model a, a PPC, a pro public private civic partnership, because the corporates really need to step in um, and look at how they can support you know through corporate social responsibility. In our case, I, as I was saying, you know, GeoDrill built they do boreholes, and so they said, look, we're not going to give you money, but what we can do is give you our expertise. Um, and I think that's been such a strong story and, and, and that's really helped us. Our law firm, JLD and MB, 
they're like, we're not going to give you money, but we can give you our legal services. And what we're finding is a lot of people are coming alongside now that we are coming to the end of this. And so it's really important that we try to support each other. So we support Doxo to be strong, but we've got a lot of corporate support. And um, civic leaders like UNFPA who really helped us along as well. So I think the, the more we can all do together, the better it is. And, you know, having this platform, for example, Ivy, you know, just using your voice and your platform to say, hey, we need to shed light on this issue. That's you using your voice and saying, help help these people, right? Even if it's just one person who's been educated and realized, oh, it's not just rape, you know, emotional violence is a form of violence. That makes me happy. So thank you so much for having us on today. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've been talking for an hour. I wanna quick uh, start to wrap up because I know both of you have busy schedules. Um, first, I will um, go to uh, Nii before leaving. Um, as mentioned before, he is the country um, representative for UNFPA in Ghana. This is um, a, a screenshot from their website. Um, they are very much committed to uh, things in support of um, women and girls. Did we lose him now? It looks like we may have lost him. I'm actually here. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I can hear okay. You're back. You're back. Um, so I wanted you to just uh, quickly wrap up with some final thoughts. And then um, if there is a link that people can go to for, um, you mentioned that there's some volunteers that you're looking for in the next couple of days. If you can provide that information so people can make contact if they're interested. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Ivy. Um, the, the, uh, let me just end with something that we have really not talked about, which is the impact of um, COVID-19 on yes. the issues of sexual and gender-based violence in Ghana. Pandemics such as these, um, such as the one that we have right now, tend to compound prevailing gender inequalities and vulnerabilities. And it also tends to increase the risk of abuse. And during under normal circumstances, during an epidemic, women and girls may be at higher risk of experiencing intimate partner violence and other forms of um, domestic violence. This is because um, of um, heightened tensions in the household. Now, the the current pandemic um, even brings it to fall. Um, I think about four years ago, there was a, a study which showed that. Um, about 27% of Ghanaian women had experienced at least one form of domestic violence or the other. It might be physical, it might be economic, it might be sexual, social, psychological. Also, many married couples um, these days, due to the pandemic, pandemic, they are spending more time at home. Um, because government has said that we should spend more time at home and everybody is afraid of going out and all of that. But the patriarchal system of the Ghanaian society excuses domestic violence. Therefore, we should, I mean, it comes to, it comes clear into clear focus that the issues of domestic violence, the occurrence will be more than we used to have. That's, um, that's our estimation. Also, because in other countries, the issues, are, I mean, where there is the reporting systems are clear and credible, we've seen a very, very steep rise. So we assume that there will be. What we did was to do some sort of advocacy out there, advertisement and what have you. We believe that it would have achieved some impact in some form. But then in um even though we don't have too much reports about what would have what would have happened, it still um behooves on us to ensure that we will release the word out there about the issues of sexual and domestic violence. But also at the same time everybody needs to come on board. It's an advocacy that will involve everybody because it is when we reduce sexual and domestic violence, incidents of gender-based violence, it is for the good of the society at the end of the day, for the good, for the well-being of you and me. If we all see it from that lens, then everybody will work towards it and then we can bring it down. So I, 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 I enjoy everybody, please, to come join us in this fight against sexual and gender-based violence. Information about how to... Um, how to how to volunteer how to get on board you will see it in, on our website as from tomorrow we'll also have a, a flyer which will be which will be will, which will be willing to share with everybody so that you can go out there so that we can get everybody recruited into the arms i want to thank you very much Ivy, for this opportunity 
Thank you so much for making the time uh, to be here today as well. Thank you so much. Um, Isabel, do you have any final thoughts? Um, just, you know, to support, I think there are lots of issues. Um, I don't think we're saying that gender violence is the only issue, but it is a fundamental issue and it doesn't get enough um, airtime. And so I think, you know, they, they, it's not just our organization. They're an incredible number of advocates. I think it's good to find something that you're passionate about. Um, we certainly need support in finalizing our building. Uh, we have ambitions to build elsewhere because we realize the intense need um, of the safe house. And so it, it really is important to support where you can. But I agree that people have different talents and we've been really fortunate with that. We're about to launch our mobile app, um, which again, it's an advocacy tool. So we're creating a platform where we can share survivor stories. We'll have a resource section so you can have things like the Domestic Violence Act so you can actually download it and, and read it um, and, and lots of inspiring stories. But we need, we need supports, right? So your support might be, hey, I'm really good at graphics or hey, I'm good at research. But find someone to help because it's really a huge need in this sector and very little resource. Yes, very little resources. And uh, that's not exclusive to Ghana. I hear other countries talking about little resources mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I'm glad that the two of you are both actively involved in uh, you know, doing things that help to support people who are suffering from these challenges in their life. Um, those of you watching, um, if you are interested in volunteering um, here in Ghana, go to the UNFPA uh, website and uh, find out how you can volunteer for Ghana. He said it will be on the website um, within the next couple of days. And then um, with the Pearl Safe House, I did put the uh, website link on the screen. I'll put it back on right now. You can uh, make your donations to the Pearl Safe Haven um, by going to the website. This is the donation link here. Um, I'll also put it in the description box of the video once this live stream is finished. The video will still be available for people to watch later who were not able to join live. You can follow the Pearl Safe Haven on Instagram at Pearl Safe Haven and get updates on campaigns that they are doing um, on, a, on a regular basis. So um, I thank you both again for taking the time out of your day you. to come and discuss this important topic. I know it's, as I said in the beginning, it's not a glamorous conversation, but it's definitely a necessary conversation that needs to continue. And I appreciate your time and I wish you both um, to have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Isabel. Bye. See you. Yes, please.